Lecture 10, Aeschylus. Welcome back to Lecture 10, which will begin our discussion of tragedy, the dramatic genre which had its genesis in Athens in the late 6th and early 5th century BC. In the next three lectures, this one and the two following, we'll discuss tragedy and the work of the three great Athenian tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. I want to begin in this lecture with giving you a brief overview of what we know about the background and development of tragedy, talking a bit about its performance in Athens, and then move on to talk about Aeschylus and his great trilogy, the Oresteia. We do not know the exact origins of tragedy. We don't know precisely how it developed or even precisely when it began, though tradition says that the first performance of a tragedy was given in Athens by a man named Thespis in 534 BC. Aristotle, the fourth century philosopher, scientist, literary critic, general polymath, tells us that tragedy was invented when Thespis separated himself out as a character from the chorus of a dithyram. If you remember from the last lecture, dithyrams were choral lyrics sung in honor of Dionysus, and Aristotle says that Thespis got the idea of, in effect, stepping out of the chorus, taking on the character, performing, acting a character rather than just reporting on what a character had said, and that this was the origin of, or the first performance of something that could be recognized as a tragedy. This may well be, but unfortunately we know so little about dithyram that it's hard for us to judge if Aristotle was correct in this or not, and he was writing some two centuries later, so while his guess carries a great deal of weight, he wasn't a contemporary of Thespis and perhaps doesn't really know how tragedy began. Tragedy and comedy were both performed at annual festivals in honor of the god Dionysus, just as dithyram was poetic perform poetry performed in honor of Dionysus, so also tragedy was a form of poetry performed in honor of Dionysus, as was comedy as well. The majority of surviving plays, however, tragic and comic, do not deal with the god Dionysus in any direct or obvious manner, and the exact nature for Dionysus' association with drama remains unclear. One theory that many scholars have held is that tragedy somehow developed out of early ritual dramas performed in honor of Dionysus rather than out of dithyram, as Aristotle said. Perhaps so, we have no direct evidence of that, but perhaps there were ritual dramas in honor of Dionysus and then the subject matter of tragedy expanded to include other storylines as well. Another theory sees the origins of tragedy not in a separation of one character out from dithyram, but rather in a kind of fusion of epic and lyric performance. This makes a great deal of sense to me, because if you think of what was already happening in epic, where the narrator reports direct speech of characters, we'll say, thus Agamemnon spoke, and then we'll give a direct speech of Agamemnon's, and then we'll say, so he spoke. It doesn't take too much imagination to get from that to a second person speaking the lines. So a narrator who would become the chorus of tragedy and then someone else speaking the lines of individual characters. So this is another theory about the origins of tragedy, that epic and lyric in effect came together, epic recitation by one bard, choral lyric, and out of that we got tragedy. We honestly don't know and probably will continue not to know. Tragedies were performed as part of a competition at the city Dionysia, an annual festival held in honor of the god Dionysus in Athens. So it was called the city Dionysia. There were also rural festivals in honor of Dionysus. Each year, three tragedians would enter into competition with one another for first, second, and third prize. Each playwright would enter into competition three tragedies, three separate tragedies, plus a satyr play, which was a short burlesque drama, funny, almost slapstick, featuring satyrs, those half-man, half-beast mythical followers of Dionysus as its chorus, and judges awarded first, second, and third prizes to the tragedians who entered into competition. One implication of this, which is worth bearing in mind, is that this means the great Greek tragedians wrote their plays on the assumption that they would be performed once and only once. 
They did not assume Aeschylus, when he wrote the Oresteia, was not hoping for a run of two or three years on Broadway. He was expecting to have his, his plays performed one time and only one time at that year's competition. The subject matter of tragedy was drawn almost exclusively from traditional myth, although very occasionally tragedians would write plays on recent events of history. We have a play of Aeschylus called The Persians, for instance, which is about the war between Greece and Persia. Taking the plots of tragedy from myth, and by far the majority of them were taken from myth, meant that the very broad outlines of the story would already be known to most of the audience. The tragedian's creativity and skill lay not in inventing a new story, but in the use he made of the traditional material. While keeping to the overall given storyline, the tragedian could refocus, reshape the story to bring out whatever points he wanted or to highlight certain aspects or themes. In this regard, obviously, the tragedian's method was very similar to Homer's or thinking back a few more lectures to what we discussed in the Deuteronomistic Historian's approach to the David stories. The difference is that with the tragedians, we know who wrote these plays. We know the precise names and dates of the authors who wrote them. And so we can see more precisely what exact political or cultural impulses these authors may have been responding to in their reshaping of myth and their tragedies. The cast of a Greek tragedy consisted of three actors and a chorus. Plays were performed in op outdoor open air theaters. So very little in the way of artificial staging, certainly no artificial lighting, very little in the way of sound effects. The actors were all male and the, the three of them, the three actors, played all the individual roles in any given tragedy. So this means that one actor would play two or different, two or three different roles within one play. He would come on as, say, Agamemnon, exit, and come back on as Agamemnon's cousin and murderer, Aegisthus, for instance. And it also means, since all the actors were male, that the great female characters of Greek tragedy, Clytemnestra, Antigone, Electra, Medea, all of them were played by men. They were played not by women, but by men. Both of these aspects of Athenian acting, one actor playing several roles within a play and males playing females, both of these aspects of Athenian acting were facilitated by the use of masks. The actors always wore masks, and that made it easier for the audience to tell if the same actor goes off stage as one character, comes back on as another character, what the audience sees is a different mask. So the potential for confusion would probably not have been very great. The chorus, too, was all male. And like the actors, the chorus members wore masks. The chorus consisted of 12 or perhaps 15 members. It often represents a marginal group, such as old men, women, or slaves. And the chorus normally takes no direct part in the action. Rather, it comments upon the action, provides mythological exempla to parallel the action, but, and provides background information for the audience, but doesn't take a direct part in the action. The word chorus comes from a Greek word meaning dance, and like the performers of choral lyric, the chorus in a Greek tragedy sang their lines and danced simultaneously. So Greek tragedy was written in poetic form, and it was sung, or largely sung. Even the actors' lines were probably at least intoned, if not sung. In fact, opera developed in Italy as an attempt to recreate the original staging practices of Greek tragedy. And so when we think of Greek tragedy, we should probably think of something a bit more like opera and a bit less like Shakespeare, surprising though that sounds. The conditions in the theater of Dionysus in Athens would have precluded any kind of naturalistic acting, even had these words not been sung rather than spoken. The audience probably consisted of somewhere between 12,000 to 17,000 people, most of whom were a significant distance above the actors. If you can picture a Greek theater in your minds, you'll recognize, you'll realize that most of the people in that theater are sitting pretty far up 
the slanted seating that goes up a hillside. It's almost more like watching an athletic competition, a football game, where you recognize the players by the numbers on their jerseys, but you can't see their faces. You'd recognize the actors by the masks they were wearing, these large and exaggerated masks, but obviously there's no room for naturalistic acting in this kind of theatrical circumstance. The masks make facial expression impossible in, in, in any ex event, and as I already mentioned, there could be no artificial lighting, very little in the way of sound effects, probably very little, if any, scenery. The fifth century, when tragedy came into its own in Athens, was a period of exceptional intellectual, cultural, literary, and political innovation in Athens, and also a century of a great deal of turmoil. And this seems to have provided the perfect atmosphere for the development of Greek tragedy. We know of several tragedians who wrote in the fifth century, but three of them were considered outstanding in their own day. The first of the three great tragedians, Aeschylus, lived from probably 525, we're not sure of his birth date, to 456 BC. We do know the exact year he died. We know the titles of 82 of his plays, and ancient sources tell us that he wrote 90 plays. 90 plays total, we know the titles of 82, but only seven have survived. So we have only a tiny segment of Aeschylus's overall output. And one of those seven, Prometheus Bound, may very well not be by Aeschylus at all. A great many scholars think it's by someone else, perhaps his grandson, who also would have been named Aeschylus following Greek naming practices. The second and third great tragedians were Sophocles and Euripides, and we'll discuss them in the next two lectures. They get one lecture apiece. We don't know much about Aeschylus's life beyond the fact that he fought in the Great Persian Wars near the beginning of the fifth century. We know that he fought at the Battle of Marathon in the first Persian invasion of Greece in 490 BC, and he probably fought at Salamis, the Battle of Salamis in 480 during the second Persian invasion of Greece as well. And as I already mentioned, we know that he died in 456. And interestingly, he considered his own service in the Persian Wars more important than his work as a tragedian, if we can judge by his epitaph, which tradition tells us he wrote himself. He had mentioned on his tombstone that he had fought in the Persian Wars. He did not mention anything about any tra tragedies. So Aeschylus himself saw his role as one of the Greeks who defeated the Persians at Marathon in 490 as more important than his role as the author of the Oresteia, at least if we can judge by his tombstone. We know more about Aeschylus's career as a tragedian than we know about his life itself. He won his first victory at the city Dionysia in 484. One ancient source tells us that he won 13 victories in all. Another says that he won 28 times, that he came in first place 28 times as opposed to 13. Now this higher figure very likely includes victories that he won after his death with restaging of his works. And the very fact that his tragedies were allowed to be re-entered into later competitions after he was dead indicates the extraordinarily high status that he held in Athens. That was by no means a usual thing. But Aeschylus was considered so great a playwright that some of his works were restaged after his death. And so it may be that he won first prize in the competition several times after he was already dead. As I mentioned a few moments ago, each playwright, each tragedian, would enter three tragedies into competition each year. Aeschylus favored writing trilogies on unified themes with his three tragedies. In other words, he favored, rather than writing three different plays on three different topics, three different storylines, he favored carrying the same storyline on through all three plays, so that in effect he treated the three plays as three acts of one much longer play. And this allowed him to explore the development of one story through all three plays, and to some extent even in the Seder play as well. You may be wondering how we know this if all we have left is seven plays. Remember, we know the titles of 82 of his plays, and we can tell by the titles listed together in groups of three for which year he entered them into competition. We can tell which ones are about the same storyline, which ones are in effect unified trilogies rather than three dis distinct stories entered together. Our only surviving example of such a trilogy is the Oresteia, is Aeschylus's Oresteia. 
Sophocles and Euripides, unlike Aeschylus, did not usually use the trilogy form. They normally entered three plays, which while they might have a thematic connection of some sort, three troubled marriages, for instance, something like that, were not parts of the same storyline. So Sophocles and Euripides normally didn't use the trilogy form. Despite the common use of the term Theban trilogy to refer to Sophocles' three plays about Oedipus and his family, those plays were not written as a trilogy at all. They were written in different years. In fact, uh, Antigone was written about 15 years before Oedipus the King, and Oedipus at Colonus was written at the very end of Sophocles' life. So people will often refer to Sophocles' Theban trilogy, but that's really a misnomer. Those three plays were not written in the same year. They were not written to be performed together. The Oresteia by Aeschylus is the only true trilogy that we have complete, and even for it, we don't have the satyr play. So we don't have any complete grouping of three plays plus a satyr play. The Oresteia was performed in 458 BC, just two years before Aeschylus' death, so it is a work of his maturity. And as the only extant trilogy, it's invaluable for giving us a sense of how the trilogy form worked in Aeschylus's hands, how he explored a theme or a set of themes throughout all three plays, set up ideas in the first play that he would continue through the second and resolve in the third. The Oresteia lets us see how not just themes and complex strands of imagery, but even turns of phrasing in the first play, come back up in the second and third, are reiterated, amplified, and finally resolved. And by the way, this would be a good point to mention that the term tragedy in Greek usage did not necessarily mean terribly sad story. It came to mean that because most of the storylines in mythology are unpleasant, and most of the ones the tragedians chose to, wrote, to write about were, in fact, tragic in the sense that we use the term. But as you'll see in a few moments, the Oresteia has basically a happy ending. The problems are resolved, things are taken care of. Agamemnon, the first play of the trilogy, is definitely tragic in our sense of the, ter the term. The third play of the trilogy is not. In Greek usage, tragedy referred to the form of the drama rather than to its content, at least in its earliest stages. Now, the first play of the Oresteia, Agamemnon, deals with Agamemnon's return after the Trojan War and his murder by his wife Clytemestra and her lover Aegisthus. Her name appears in two forms in Greek, Clytemnestra and Clytemestra. Aeschylus uses the form Clytemestra, so that's what I'll call her in this lecture. The chorus lets us know, early in the play Agamemnon, that Clytemestra is motivated in large part by vengeance. She doesn't just want to continue her adulterous affair with Aegisthus, though that's part of it. Mainly, she murders Agamemnon to take vengeance for Agamemnon's killing of their daughter, Iphigenia, ten years previously. In a detail of the Trojan War story that seems to be completely unknown to Homer, it's not mentioned in either the Iliad or the Odyssey, the goddess Artemis had demanded that Agamemnon sacrifice his own daughter Iphigenia in order to get a fair wind to sail to Troy. Artemis had made the wind blow against the Greeks. In order to get a fair wind to sail to Troy, Agamemnon had to sacrifice his own child as though she were a sacrificial animal, and he did. Clytemestra, understandably enough, has been brooding over this for the past 10 years, the 10 years of the Trojan War. And so when Agamemnon returns home, Clytemestra and her lover Aegisthus, who happens to be Agamemnon's cousin, kill Agamemnon, Clytemestra in part to get vengeance for her daughter Iphigenia. And these themes of familial murder, familial murder motivated at least in part by vengeance, resonate throughout the trilogy, the Oresteia. And the second play of the trilogy, Libation Bearers, Agamemnon's son Orestes, his grown son Orestes, avenges his father's murder some years afterwards by killing the murderers, Clytemestra and Aegisthus. However, Clytemestra is Orestes' mother. So in order to avenge his father's death, he has to kill his own mother, and this means he has committed a terrible transgression. One is not to kill one's mother under any circumstances, even though one must avenge one's father. Something of a problem for Orestes, as we'll come back to in a few minutes. The Furies, 
goddesses of blood vengeance, pursue Orestes to punish him, and the third play of the trilogy, Eumenides, which is a euphemistic term for the Furies, it actually means the kindly ones, Eumenides means the kindly ones, the third play of the trilogy resolves these issues of vengeance and counter-vengeance when the goddess Athena sets up a court in Athens where Orestes is put on trial for murdering his mother and is, in fact, acquitted. The Oresteia is an extraordinarily complex work of literature. No brief discussion can even begin to do it justice. In my teaching company course on tragedy, if I'm remembering right, I devote three lectures to the Oresteia alone. And here I'm trying to do the background of tragedy and the Oresteia all in one lecture. But I can at least note in passing some of the profoundly important issues that Aeschylus addresses with this trilogy. First of all, the story he chooses is one of the most famous and one of the most haunting in all Greek mythology. Agamemnon belongs to a family, usually referred to as the House of Atreus, that's his father's name, Atreus, that suffers under a multi-generational hereditary curse. And this hereditary curse of the House of Atreus tends to express itself in intergenerational violence, in parents killing children, uncles killing nephews. Um, Agamemnon's father, Atreus, had killed his own nephews, the sons of his brother Thyestes, cooked them and served them to Thyestes for dinner. This is not a pleasant group of people we're talking about. And this means, this intergenerational violence, this hereditary curse, means that the dreadful deeds that Agamemnon, Clytemestra, and Orestes commit have the weight of inevitability about them. They're from a doomed family. They're from a cursed family, a family that does this kind of thing to one another. But in Aeschylus's treatment, it's also crucial that the individuals in this story act not merely out of fated necessity nor out of malice, but out of an attempt to reconcile impossibly conflicting duties. And let's think about that for a minute. Agamemnon's murder of Iphigenia is terrible. It's shocking. It's horrifying. But Agamemnon is caught between two paramount duties. He is the leader of the Greek army on its way to Troy to fight the Trojan War. And in Aeschylus's telling of the story, Zeus has directly commanded the expedition. That's made very, very clear because by kidnapping Helen, Paris has violated the laws of hospitality, which is an area that Zeus oversees and protects. So Zeus says to Agamemnon, in effect, you must go to Troy. That's commanded by Zeus. Artemis says you can't go to Troy unless you kill your daughter. A commander of an army must lead his army. A father must not kill his daughter. Agamemnon is caught between two extremely important and utterly contradictory duties. There's no good way out for him. This is even clearer in the next generation with Orestes' dilemma. Orestes, a son, must avenge his father's death. He has no choice. He is morally bound to avenge his father's death. A son must not kill his mother. Orestes is caught. There is no good action he can take. There is no way out. Either he has to leave his father unavenged, which is a terrible moral transgression, or he has to kill his mother, which is a terrible moral transgression. There is no good choice for him to make. So far from being a mere horror story about the world's most dysfunctional family, the Oresteia is a meditation on individual human beings' inability to find the right thing to do in such situations of conflict. What are we to do when we are caught between two paramount moral duties, neither one of which allows an escape clause? So that's part of what Aeschylus is talking about in the Oresteia. And finally, he uses these irreconcilable conflicts to discuss the transition of society from a system of archaic blood vengeance to a system of civic justice. So the myth of the house of Atreus becomes a means for Aeschylus to examine methods of justice and the civic value of a court system. Orestes' dilemma as the son of the murdered man and the son of the murderous woman is insoluble according to an archaic system of individual blood vengeance. And that is the system that is definitely assumed by Greek mythology. 
the stories about the mythic age are stories in which justice is carried out by individual family members avenging wrongs against their other individual family members. There are no courts on Odysseus's Ithaca or in Menelaus's Sparta. Vengeance has to be carried out on the individual level. And so Orestes' dilemma in that system of justice is absolutely insoluble. A system of blood vengeance works more or less as long as the murderer and the victim are from different families, though it is disconcertingly open-ended. Where do you stop taking vengeance? But still, it at least works more or less as long as you're from different families. But Orestes collapses the whole thing into himself. He is both the relative of the victim and the relative of the murderer, and so he's left with no way to solve this problem. The only way out is through the invention of a new system of justice by removing the duty of exacting vengeance from the victim's heirs and handing it over to society, in other words, by inventing a court system. And in Eumenides, Aeschylus shows us Orestes going to Athens on the advice of Apollo, and Apollo, in fact, accompanies him, and Athena inaugurates just such a court system. So Orestes is, in effect, the first defendant ever on a murder charge in the first trial ever held, and Eumenides is, in effect, the first courtroom drama in the Western literary tradition. Apollo works as the defense lawyer, the furies of the prosecution, Athena serves as the judge, and Athena herself reiterates the idea of conflicting claims to justice that has run throughout the earlier plays. She says that both the Furies and Orestes have right on their side, and she says this matter is too big for any individual, even her, even a goddess, to decide. And so she appoints a jury of Athenian citizens to hear the case. She articulates the idea for us that where one individual cannot find their way out of this kind of dilemma, a group, a jury, can. After Apollo and the Furies both present their arguments, the jurors vote. Now, there are two separate interpretations among scholars of exactly how the jurors voted, depending on the number of jurors. If Aeschylus assumed an even number of jurors, the first interpretation is that the jurors' votes are tied. If, say, there are 12 of them, six vote to convict Orestes, six vote to acquit, Athena steps in, casts a vote that breaks the tie, and thus Orestes is acquitted. The second interpretation is that the number of jurors is uneven and that they vote by one to convict Orestes. Athena steps in, casts a vote that makes the tie. In actual Athenian legal practice, a tied vote counted as an acquittal. So either way, Orestes would be acquitted. Now, I think that it's more likely, that, dramatically speaking, that the jurors were exactly evenly tied. In other words, human ingenuity cannot find its way out of this, even with a jury. There are conflicting claims of right on either side. There isn't any way out. Athena steps in and breaks the tie. But either way we stage it, either way we assume that the voting went, Athena's deciding vote establishes the precedent for acquittal in the case of a tie. You can assume that whenever there's a tied vote, Athena is standing in the background casting a vote for acquittal. And with Orestes' acquittal, the curse on the house of Atreus is lifted, and Orestes walks out of the courtroom a free man and also walks out of the heroic age, in effect, into a normal human life. Now, one fascinating aspect of Aeschylus's treatment of justice in the Oresteia is that we can see a direct connection between the mythic story of Aeschylus's text and the social conditions of his own day. This is why it's so valuable to know who he was, when and where he lived. Aeschylus reshapes traditional mythic material both to describe and to demonstrate the value of the Athenian court system. In the fifth century when Aeschylus was writing, Athens did indeed have a system of trial by jury, and that had been in place since at least the early sixth century BC. But remember, Aeschylus is using a mythic story that dates back to the time of the Trojan War, the 12th century. Now surely he and his audience knew that their own court system had only been invented about a hundred years previously, 120 years previously, in their great-great-grandparents' day. They knew that it did not stretch all the way back to the time of the Trojan War. What Aeschylus does is backdate 
the invention of the court system into mythic time to give it a kind of imaginative power and mythic resonance and importance. And I think this is particularly noteworthy because of a political development of Aeschylus's own day. In Eumenides, Aeschylus situates Orestes' trial on the Areopagus, the hill of Ares in Athens. This was the meeting place of an actual political council called the Areopagus Council, whose powers had been extremely important in the 6th century, but had been decreased in the 5th century. In 462, so just four years before the staging of the Oresteia, the powers of the Areopagus Council were radically decreased. Previous to that time, the Areopagus had dominated most areas of Athenian government. The reforms of 462 restricted its powers to trying cases of homicide, arson, and malicious wounding, what we would call assault and battery. Eumenides can be read as a response to these reforms of 462. Aeschylus may be disapproving. The reformers show disrespect to an ancient institution. I think, personally, it's more likely that he's showing approval. The members of the Areopagus Council still have a crucial role to play in Athens. Look how important deciding cases of murder is. Athena set up a court to do that. Athena inaugurated this. She herself cast the first vote. You, members of the Areopagus, still have an important role to play, even though you're now mainly limited to trying cases of homicide. So because we know the date of the Areopagus reforms, 462, and because we know the date of the Oresteia, 458, we can see quite clearly how the political reality of Aeschylus's own day motivates his choice of topic for this great trilogy, the Oresteia. So in this lecture, we've introduced tragedy, looked very briefly at Aeschylus's use of myth. In the next lecture, we'll turn to the second of the great tragedians, Sophocles.